Amen. Let's turn to Romans chapter number 5. As you're turning there, I'm glad to see you this morning. It's been a long week, a good week in the Lord. Um, we touched down in Honduras uh, last Friday, and we never stopped until uh, last night as we pulled in to Nashville International uh, about 10:30. We after 11 o'clock after we left there, I got here about 1:30 last night. Like I said, it's been a good week. We have walked many mountains, many hills. We've seen many souls saved. We went into many schools, and we're going to have presentations on all this slideshows. Have some of our other team come and talk. We'll set that up in the weeks to come. Uh, we didn't want to do it today. You didn't have time to prepare. Getting back last night at 1:30 and into the bed, but. Just be praying for our team. We've got to work this bacteria out of our system that we picked up there. And uh, we'll try to uh, be back to our normal. I told Miss Linda just then I feel like roadkill right now. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just you can't help. But when you go over there, sooner or later you're going to be sick. You can eat everything they want you to eat right, drink everything right. It just happens. You get the bacteria. Uh, you forget one day you're brushing your teeth and you're using a bottle of water and you accidentally stick your toothbrush under the sink how you do every day at home and brush your teeth and then uh, you, ends up get, you end up getting sick. Uh, Jenna uh, was sick a few times and I said, well, what have you been doing? She's like, I brush my teeth in the shower every day. I'm like, no, no. You know, so we, there are some little things you don't know and you do know. It, it was just a blessed week. We went to one school the last days. It was about... 600 or more kids, 1,500 in the school, and many uh, professions of, of faith in Christ. See, this village that we go to, and I will tell you more about it in the days to come, uh, Santa Barbara and Ilama, we are the only missionaries that go to th that area. Um, there's, there's no more. We're the, uh, we are the only Americans that go into that area in Honduras and work in a year's time. So the eight days that we are in country, we are the only Americans they see. Uh, there's a few churches there, but Honduras is a works-based culture. And we know that if you add works to grace, it cancels out grace. You can't have both. Uh, works come after your salvation. Works do not come to bring about your salvation. You get saved, and then you do what God wants you to do. Amen? Well, that whole culture over there is, uh, I once was saved. I'm not saved anymore. I'm doing the best I can. When I get there, I hope I'll make it. So that's what we run into the whole time we are there. And um, it's just a spiritual battle from the very beginning. From the time you set ground. What we do is we give out food. We, we told people about Jesus. And, and it's just a spiritual battle. It's not we don't work on things. We don't construct anything. We hit the ground saying, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? It's a completely evangelical trip. We do do a lot of uh, rice and beans. We give them rice and beans in order for them to let us come into their home and we talk to them we offer them gifts and they let us in uh, but it was a great week a great trip uh, you would be very proud of all of our team members that went um, there was great team unity there was great uh, zeal there was no laziness it was it was great uh, we we uh, we saw some great things happen so um, Jenna and, and Kayla and Bridget and my wife my mom and dad and then the team from Atlanta everybody did so wonderful well, it's, it's tiring you all day long right near the equator sun all day and you just go to bed with the thought i'm getting up the next morning you get up you study the word of god you go to breakfast you go to devotion you go back out into the streets and then you eat lunch you go back out into the streets and you eat supper go home get dressed go to church come back get another shower probably second or third one you've had that day because you're so hot then get in bed get back up the next morning so it is a tiring grueling schedule but those people, I don't want to see them go to hell. Um, I don't want to see anybody go to hell. I'm, but I'm just one man. I can't go everywhere. So I believe God's put on my heart to go to this place. And I pray you'll be praying not only here, but where God would have you to go, that people might hear the word of Jesus Christ and be saved. Romans chapter 5. And we'll talk about what a friend we have in Jesus uh, this morning. We've been on the Purpose Driven Life series. And we want to talk about... Uh, how to become a friend of Christ, and then how to cultivate that friendship this morning. Um, 
when you are saved, you become a friend of Christ. And then after you are saved, you keep cultivating that friendship. You keep doing what it takes in order for you to be best friends. Uh, you have friends, you have best friends, you have close acquaintances. But uh, the Scripture teaches plainly that God is our friend. What a friend we have in Jesus, the old song says. All our sins and griefs to bear. And I just want you to know that God loves you. Uh, he, he cares for you so deeply. But not only is He your Father, He's your Savior, your Lord, is your Master, but God is your friend. I want you to hear that. If you don't think you have any other friends in this world, you have a friend in God Himself, in His Son Jesus, in the Holy Spirit. I want you to understand that the purpose of God in your life is cultivating relationship uh, this morning. Let's read Romans chapter number 5. Let's just read a few verses here. Let's read 1 through 11 uh, to get us going today. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into a place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead us to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. Verse 6. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. That's us. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. Though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. Verse 8. But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Verse 10. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of His Son while we were still His enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of His Son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. Father, help us to understand that we are friends of God. God, thank you for being my friend. Thank you for never leaving me. Thank you for always being there for me. God, thank you that when I need to talk, you're there. And when I need correction, you're there. And when I need help, you're there. When, and, and when all is good, you're still there. Thank you for being my friend. God, I don't think there's someone here this morning that needs a friend. I think there's someone here this morning, Father, that is searching for a friend or searching for acceptance or searching for love, searching for a lot of different things, God. May, Father, they find you this morning in your fullness. Lord, thank you so much for making it possible through Jesus Christ, your Son, for us to be your friend. Thank you, Jesus, for giving up your life willingly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verse 11 says that Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. I don't know that I can truly comprehend being a friend of God. Uh, like Moses, like Abraham, like those who were close with Him in the Old Testament. Um, just like it was intended to be. Just like God wanted it to be. Uh, not an enemy anymore, but a friend. Do you understand? Before you get saved, you are an enemy of God. But after you get saved, you become a friend of God. And friendship with God is only possible through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen? Now, if I come up to you and I want to be your friend, I have to cultivate that relationship, correct? I don't call you friend unless I know you, unless we hang out, unless we, we have things in common. You know, there's a difference in an acquaintance and a friend but see the way you come to be a friend of God first off is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ his son you know John chapter 15 and verse 5 talks about that he no longer calls us servants but he calls us this friend this relationship this close contact how 
does that happen, though? It's not the same as today, even though in a little while we'll talk about how to cultivate that friendship. Today I want you to understand, number one, we have peace with God because of what Jesus did. Amen? You just didn't wander up one day and be like, God's my friend. See, Jesus had to make a way for you to not be an enemy anymore. Jesus had to bring you across that great divide. He had to bring you out of your sin. He had to bring you to a place of peace with God. You've been made right with God by faith. Now, you understand God brought you to the place of needing to be saved, but by faith... You appropriated what He has done for you on the cross at Calvary. You're just not automatically saved. When you are convicted of the Holy Ghost, conviction of your sin, when you see the necessity of God in your life, when you understand what Jesus Christ has done for you at the cross, then by faith He says that He made us at friends, He made us at peace, and it's because of what Jesus did. And when we give Him our faith, Faith, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and what He did, then we become friends of God. It is an action that has resulted through the Holy Spirit working inside of us. And what I loved about these verses when I read them, it said that it was a place of undeserved privilege. Amen? If you think you deserve your salvation, you might want to get saved. I mean, if you think I'm all that, you've missed that He's the only one that is all. All-compassing, all-powerful. The only one that could save us. We could not save ourselves. So when I understand salvation, I understand I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. I can't earn it. I can't keep it. It is all by Him. It is completely undeserved. If I got what I deserved, I would burn in hell from the beginning. I would be born. I would die. I would go to hell. That's what I deserve. But through Jesus, He makes a way for us to be friends with God. So I love that when I read that it is an undeserved privilege. A privilege that God has granted us, though none of us could ever deserve it. None of us could ever be good enough. None of us could ever give enough. You can give to that offering to your heart's content. You can give millions of dollars and you can still die and go to hell. You can come to church every week and die and go to hell. You can feed the orphans and widows and die and go to hell because it's not about reaching a place where you deserve to be a child of God. It is about understanding that you can't coming to Christ by faith and just living in that place of undeserved privilege. I do not deserve it. I do not deserve it one bit. I've done nothing to earn it. And if I could keep it, I would lose it. But a friend is one who gives us something that we don't deserve. Amen? A friend. God is our friend. He has befriended us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And we says we are confident in verse number 2. I am confident and joyful because of what God's done. I get to be a part of the glory of God. Not only here, but there. I get to experience the salvation of God. I get to experience your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when He calls me His friend through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it is so much more than just a friendship. I am now a part taker in the glory of God here and now I get to be a part of something heavenly in this earthly body I get to be a part of something great isn't that what everybody in the world wants is to be a part of something that's bigger than them I mean, when you grow up you look at being all these things you look at being you know when you were a kid anybody ever want to go to the moon you know what I'm talking do you remember those days now remember back when you had fun you were a kid you were real little, and you had an imagination. We seem to lose those as we get older, amen? amen. So we get this, ima- and we wanted to be a rocket scientist. I wanted to go to the moon. I wanted to, I wanted to be, well, I wanted to be like Rambo. You know, I watched Rambo movies, so I'm, I'm Rambo in the jungle somewhere. But, you know, other kids wanted to be, fi- you know, all these things that was greater. We were just real little, but we had these aspirations of being something greater than we had ever wanted to be you know it was just something about these things this sparkle and for us now to understand that you are seated in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus you have been you you've been put into something greater than you could ever grow into here on this earth you get to participate in the glory of God 
joyfully and confidently. I stand before you this morning knowing the truth of what this word says because I have personally experienced it. I have lived it out and I know there is no greater glory than being a part of God's kingdom. Amen? I've been number one and I've been in last place but there's nothing that compares to being a child of God, being a friend of God. God and these verses here tell us that we were utterly helpless can you imagine what that means can you imagine here's here's God and the great divide and here's us and we are completely unable to get to God unless something spans that divide and what has spanned that divide is the blood of Jesus Christ the, the sacrifice of Christ. Utterly helpless means it was impossible for me to get to God except for the person of Jesus Christ. Verse number 6, when we were utterly helpless. Now, have you ever been utterly helpless? You have before you got saved. You realized, I cannot do this. I will die and go to hell. I will burn for my sin. I, this is, I can't do this. I can't, I can't even go out and tell people about Jesus on my own. I can't. All these things, that, as I was growing up as a teenager in church, all these things that I kept trying to do that I kept failing at doing. I would try, I would fail, I would try, I would fail. And then I understood that I could not turn over a new leaf. I could not make myself better. I had to come to Christ and He would enable me to do the things God had called me to do. I had to get to this place of understanding my utter helplessness. But Christ came at the right time. At that due time, this being a friend of God, this utter helplessness, Christ came to die for me. I don't know if you know uh, that song, He Came to Me. Have you ever heard that song, He Came to Me? Uh, he came to me. And this is when I could not come to where He was. He came to me. And that's why He died on Calvary. Because I could not get to where he was. I couldn't, I couldn't make it. I, could, I was just crawling around. I was in, in that feeble, that fetal position, drawn up in myself. I could do nothing utterly helpless, like a babe, like a, like, a, like a Sophie, like my little girl, utterly helpless to feed herself, utterly helpless to wash herself, to, to clean herself, to, to change her own diaper, to live on her own. She cannot do that without the help of her father and her mother. I came to that place, mostly her mother. <laughs> and I came to that place in my relationship with God where I understood I couldn't, I can't. I can't. I, I didn't come to God because I thought it would be a good idea. I didn't come to God because of, you know, just these, all these different ideas. I just understood that if I died that day, I was going to hell. And there's nothing that I could do or to stop that. I, I, I tried the, all the things of the world. And then there was nothing that would led me more to disappointment than knowing that I couldn't do it. But that's where I had to come through. And he says, this hope that Christ gives us now will not lead us to disappointment. Because the Holy Spirit fills our hearts he shows us how to live he shows us what to do he came to us by faith we accept him as our savior and he did it just at the right time how many stories have you heard about just at the right time when you needed him the most he came to you amen but just at the right time in the scope of humanity he came too. like he didn't come a minute late or a minute early like in God's plan for all humankind, in God's plan for the salvation of all mankind and the truth of what Christ had come to do, He came at exactly this point in history that God had planned out in God's sovereignty. He was there exactly when He was supposed to. And everything went exactly how it was supposed to go. And He chose to do it exactly how it was done. And we were so utterly helpless, we didn't understand it. And he talks about most people would be willing to die for an upright person, like a good person. Jesus would have, you know, like me, I might give my life for my children. You know, I give my wife's a good woman. I love her as Christ loves the church. In order for me to love her as Christ loves the church, I have to be willing to give my life for her. Amen? That's what I take that literally. He loved her as Christ loved the church. Christ gave his life. I have, in order to love my wife correctly, I have to be willing to give my life for her. Now, I see that love, I see that truth, and I would, if, if, the, if the gunman comes in the back door today, he walks up to Tiffany and says, I'll kill her unless one of you volunteers, you would not beat me to the volunteer. I, I, it's me. You take me, 
You leave her alone. You leave those kids. You take me. I'll die for a good woman. Uh, my wife, I love her. You know, I'd even, maybe they said for a, a good man, like a real good man. You might even die for somebody you know in the church that's, that's been upright, and that's, that's in the community, maybe your dad or your uncle or your best friend's dad. Or something. You might even step in, the, in that line, that bullet, for somebody who's done you right. Amen? Somebody who's taken care of you, somebody who's loved you. You know, that's probably normal that you would give your life for somebody who's loved you back. Wouldn't you say? But he said when we were utterly helpless, he died while we were yet enemies. If you ever doubt how much God loves you, the people who treat you the best in life do it because they love you. And because you love them back. My dad, he's good to me and he loves me and I love him. But my heavenly father loved me when I hated him. When there was no good in me, when I was blaspheming his name, when I was dragging him through the mud as a church member, when I was doing all the things I shouldn't do, and when I, in my lostness, Christ 2,000 years ago died on the cross for everyone, those who would love him and those who wouldn't. While we were all sinners, he didn't wait for you to get good to come to you and say, you want to be a part of my family. He died a long time ago and appropriated his blood for your sin while you had no, you, you didn't care. You, you didn't care about Him. How many of you have ever had a time in your life you just didn't care about God? I have. Just do my own thing. Make my own way. D just do, do what make for the... Live for the moment. Live for the minute. But Jesus lived for eternity. And more than that, He died for eternity. He died for your eternity. So He brings us into this friendship with Christ. He said, but God showed His love in verse 8 for by sending Christ to die for us that while we were yet sinners. This is why this happened. He had to die. There, but there's no condemnation anymore because we've been made right by the blood of Jesus Christ. The wrath of God has been taken off of us because of the friendship now that we have with Him. If you ever doubt God loves you, don't go back to what he's, what he's done for you financially. It's good. Count your blessings. Thank Him for those things. Don't go back to what He's done for you physically. He might have healed your body. He might not have had a... But you can always know that God loves you when you go back to the cross at Calvary. You can't miss it there. Sometimes when you're dying of cancer and you've been praying for it to, to be healed and you don't understand why it hasn't been healed even though it's not God's will to heal everybody, even though this, this world teaches that it is, sometimes you, get, you might get a little down. Or sometimes when things aren't going right in your marriage, in your life, you might wonder, where's God in all this? Where's the love of God? The love of God's the same place it's always been in His Son, Jesus Christ. And the greatest love He ever showed us was by making us His friends through His Son. He was willing to sacrifice His Son for our friendship. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of His Son. Restored. We were against Him, but He's always been for us. Amen? He, listen, He's the only friend that you've ever had that's never been against you. Boy, I've had friends that I called my friends that when the day was done and the lights were turned off, they were nowhere to be found. And even though they said they'd always be here for me, I haven't heard from them in years and years. But there's one friend that sticks closer than a brother. There's one friend that I can always count on. And because, listen, here's how you know you can always count on this friend. Because the friendship is based on the sonship. The Son of God. As long as Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then you are a friend of God if you have put your faith in Him. Because you're given your righteousness through Jesus. You didn't make it. You didn't deserve it. But when you ask Christ to save you by faith, He imputed you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He gave you the ability to be righteous through His blood. So we see here that He's always going to be our friend. I can promise you this. You'll never have a better friend than God Himself. You'll never have a better friend than Jesus. Say we've all been in that... A, a, a wonderful new relationship, this new friendship. We've always been here, but now I want to focus on maintaining. If you know you are a friend of God, if you know you're saved, then God calls you friend. Amen? But I want you to get closer. 
You can be in relationship, but where's your fellowship? I, I want to go to some practical things this morning. We know we've been saved. We know we've been covered in the blood. I know that no matter what happens between here and eternity, the Bible says that I have been sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. I've been, given, I've been sealed. Like when, when, when I asked God to save me, the Holy Spirit, God Himself put His mark on me. He sealed me until that day when I meet Him. I am good to go. If you've got it, you've got it, and it's good. I mean, that's just the way it is. I don't care what anybody else says. I, I do not see a father walking away from his children. I do not see that in the Scripture. I see us breaking fellowship, but we never break relationship. I understand that Doug Greer is always my dad, and sometimes we don't see eye to eye, but he's always my dad. He never ceases to be my dad, my father. But sometimes in this fellowship, what are you going to do to become best friends? The, you are a friend of God. This scripture here has declared that you are a friend of God. But are you in that relationship? You know who you are. You know what you, what you are. You know what Christ has done for you. But are you cultivating? Now, you get saved. You don't like... When, I'm afraid that our churches don't do good discipleship. We're like, get them saved. We, okay, you're saved. Now what? We'll just figure it out on your own. No. You cultivate. Now's the time to start. The, the ground's been plowed. The good, the, good, the good Word of God. The seed has hit the soil. It's, it's going to produce something. Okay? That's what the Scripture talks about. The seed produces some type of fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100. So now it's time to start thinking about, I am a friend of God. How do I cultivate this relationship with him, let me tell you this, and we'll. Well, I promise you, we're not far from ending. I heard Brother Zike quit at twelve last week. I heard it from more than one person, so I'm going to try to. I, I don't know really what that means. I guess I think they wished you to kept going, Brother Zike. Uh, um, so, how do you cultivate this friendship through constant conversation? If you're my friend, I talk to you. If you're my friend, you talk to me. We might be an acquaintance, but to truly be the best of friends, I share my life with you and you share your life with me. Just as Jesus gave His life for us, now we give our lives for Him. He is the constant. He is not the one we run to in times of just trouble. He is the one who's always there. He is the consistency in our walk. He is the one who is in every activity. He is the one who is in every conversation, in every problem, in every thought, in everything we do. Christ is that constant. He is our friend. Are you cultivating this friendship? To be God's best friend, you must carry on an open-ended conversation with God every day, praying without ceasing. This friend that he says, we are now a friend of God. While I was in Honduras, I caught myself praying more than usual. Plane rides make me pl pray. I'm just going to be honest with you. The first, the first air pocket we hit, dear Lord. <laughs> I'm being serious. Y'all can laugh. But if that big metal bird decides to go to the ground, I'm meeting Jesus, okay? There's no in-betweens. That little safety vest you pull out from under the seat ain't going to do you no good at 38,000 feet, okay? <laughs> you are dead. And like I've heard the song said, I want to go to heaven. But I'd like to see my kids a little while longer. I love my wife. I love you. I'm going to go to heaven and be with Jesus. I just hadn't planned on it right now. So this plane, they're saying we might hit a little turbulence. And when I put that seatbelt sign on, I don't ever take mine off. I mean, when they close off, I'm going, what are these people doing? Walking around the plane. I'm just closing my eyes, praying I make it to the next place. And, and that's funny. It is funny because I'm not usually scared of much. But I don't, I, I mean, I just, I don't see how it works. I'll be honest with you. It's, it's beyond me. But God wants that type of conversation all the time. I get up in the morning and, and today and my kids come to the house. I hadn't saw them all week. And in that moment, that special moment when I woke up this morning and John Derrick was standing before me with his big lip. He just, 
no teeth, just a smiling and Maddie, Daddy, and the baby. Didn't Tiff, we was all just like zombies. And at that time, I'm saying, thank you, Jesus. Just one more time. One more time, I get to wake up and see them all right here. I got them all together in this house. Just w one more time. And then you get up and you get ready and, and, and you put on your nice clothes. You say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, so much for these nice clothes. I don't deserve them. I don't deserve this. This wardrobe I've got right here is half a year's wage in Honduras. A year. You think about some of these. I don't, I just talk to God. I say, thank you, God, for my clothes. I, I brush my teeth. There's not a lot of teeth over there. It was just hygiene, just simple stuff. The conversation of God, the conversation with my friend. How can I, I think about God's my Savior, but I want to be in that relationship. So many people think about getting saved, but they don't think about cultivating that relationship after they get saved. These short prayers. Brother Lawrence, who wrote Practicing the Presence of God over some over 450 years ago, he said, we all try to be this spiritual giant, and we take these long, exasperating prayers, and we try to get down on our knees for an hour and we pray these big long prayers and you know what happens when I do that I fall asleep and my mind wanders and before I was just praying for somebody to get healed and in just a minute I'm fishing you know what I'm talking about and then the duck blind draw on Saturday and I, I gotta go uh, Tiffany said I gotta I need to take care of these I'm sorry God I've missed this conversation, and I try these big, long conversations, but this is an everyday. We need to get into the place where we never let go of God. Where it's a constant. It's not like, okay, I'm going to set you some time aside, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you there. I'm going to do what I do all day. Okay, God, you're still there. I'm going to come back and spend some more time with you. Cultivating is that, thank you, Lord. Brother Lawrence practicing the presence of God said short burst little sentences reminders of who God is and who you are and what is thank you Lord thank you God thank you for saving me God help me through this time Lord touch my family Lord thank you for my church Lord I love you Lord, help me to trust you. I want to say you are my God. And all day long, through everything you're doing, you are just speaking to God. You are uttering phrases to your best friend. Just like on earth, our best friend in heaven, He wants to hear from us, and He wants us to speak to Him frequently. I can promise you more than you do right now. We could always stand to speak to Him more. And all the time. In every situation, in all that we do, in all that we are, continually meditating on the things of God, thinking about your friend, thinking about your father, thinking about these verses here. When you, listen, you want to meditate on God, then read His Word. You can't help. You read Romans chapter 5, and you can't help but think on what God's done for you. Boy, you just see yourself. The Word of God is like a mirror. You naturally behold who you are. And you see what you need to do. You see what you need to change. You see what God's done in you. You behold yourself in the Word of God. And you read something like this. And it tells you what your best friend has done for you. What he has appropriated for you. What he's going to do for you in the future. Where he's going to prepare a place for you. It tells you about how he gives you the strength to do what you need to do. It tells you everything you need need to go and you focus your thinking on your friend the more you think about your friend the more you will have that love for them the more the more you center your thoughts and your minds on what christ has done for you here the more you will love him and he is sitting there just looking for those who are seeking after him he's he's looking he, God is looking for those who are going, I love you, I want you, I need you. He's, he's looking for those who have put themselves into this place not to be seen doing it, not to just because it's the right thing to do, because it is their heart, it is their affection, it is their mind. What else are you going to do to develop your friendship but just think about how good God has been to you, how good He's going to be, how good for eternity, for all eternity. He's going to give you what you need. 
Being honest always helps. Amen? Amen. You can't have true friendship without honesty. So you got honest with yourself before you got saved. You got honest with yourself. You have to come to the knowledge of your sin before you can get saved. So you got honest. I'm, I'm no good. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. You got honest with yourself. And then, listen, God wants us to continue that honesty. Open-ended, honest conversation. Just like we have with God, we should, just like we have with our wives, if we love them, if, if, we, if we're right with our wives, we have open Ended honest conversations. Our friends, we have that same conversations. We are transparent. We live our lives. This is who we are. We are nobody else. This is who we are. And that's what God wants. God's, God's your friend. Your best friend. You can tell Him anything. You, you can bring anything to Him. You can, you can go to that place. You need that comfort. When everything else has failed you, you go to Him. And, and you've, you've had... Hard times and bad times, and He's there for you. But what about when you mess up? What's He want you to do then? He still wants you to come to Him. Like we got, what, you know, from the beginning, we've tried to hide our sin. Amen? Literally from the beginning. All the way back to Adam and Eve. How many of you ever as a kid broke something and then hid it? It's just our nature. And then my mother cleaning the house finally I wonder who broke this I, not me <laughs> you know then you the, the, you're just sinful and you why is it our nature to want to hide from God how many of you believe God sees all things knows all things is in every place at all times beholding the ways of men God he lets us know very plainly that he has no need for us to tell him about anybody because he knows everybody that's what the scripture talks about so he's saying in this friendship there has to be an openness. There has to be an honestness. There has to be a confession of sin. There has to, to be a rightness in your fellowship. You're right relationally. But in order to keep that fellowship right there has to be an openness and an honestness. If you mess up, it's okay. Repent. Tell God you're sorry. Turn from it. Don't do it again. And just live in what Christ has called you to do. Don't run from it. I mean, that's where we get in trouble in our, in our relationships now, is we're not open and honest. You know what church would be like if we, if we were all just really open and honest? You know what our homes would be like if we just, we just let it all... We just open, fullness, no dis, you know, full disclosure, everything that's going on. Psalm 25 says, Friendship with God is reserved for those who reverence Him, and with those He shares His secret promises. Honesty. I want to know the secrets of God. I want to know the fullness of this relationship. I want to know the fullness of what He's called us to be friends. Listen, He does not expect you to be perfect. He just expects you to be honest. You're going to mess up. He knew that. You know how he knew that? Every sin was paid for at Calvary. You know how he knew you was going to mess up? Because there was enough of blood of Jesus to forgive all sin of all mankind. He made your atonement before you ever committed the sin. He made provision before you ever knew who you were. And James says if you draw close to God, He will draw close to you the way you become better friends. You've got the relationship with that fellowship. You have to get close to Him. But in order to get close to God, you just got to be yourself. You got to be authentic. You got to see yourself for who you are. Not try to be something you're not because God knows exactly what you are and who you are and just be what He's made you to be. Come into His presence presence if you have something wrong confess it if everything's going good just bask in the glory but just be honest with god be obedient this god that is our friend john 15 talks about that he says this this might be this might be my favorite scripture of all time if not one of he says there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. No greater love in this world has ever been seen than Christ laying down His life. Then Jesus says this, 
In the next verse, in verse 13, he says, if you are my friends, do what I command you. Okay. We are a friend of God. Amen? So to cultivate that relationship, we have to be what he's called us to be. We have to do what He's called us to do. In order to live a purpose-driven life, He says, you are my friends if you do what I command. He said, you're no longer servants. You've moved out of the servant's house to the king's house. You're no longer servants, but I call you sons. I call you friends. And because we love Him, because we have that relationship, because we meditate on Him day and night, because we speak to Him, because we listen to Him, because we read His Word, because of all those things, because we've cultivated that relationship because he is not listen he is not only our friend but we are his friend in return then we do what God has called us to do that's true friendship true friends do anything they can do for their friends there's not one thing God has not promised to do for you if you need it amen He's promised to supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. There's not one promise He's made you that He won't fulfill. He's the friend. If, listen, He's that friend that if He says He's going to be there, He's going to be there. Amen? He's that friend. If He makes you a promise, He's going to keep it. Amen? And that kind of friend is the kind of friend I want. But that's the kind of friend that God expects me to be to Him. It's the kind of son he expects me, you say, let's cultivate this just a little bit. That's true friendship when it's both ways. When it's, when it's God is and I am. We have to develop it. You know, when I was a kid, my mom used to say these words. We're almost there, I promise. Friend, uh, birds of a feather flock together. You ever heard that? Birds of a feather flock together. Birds of, all my life, I heard that. I, I was wishing somebody would shoot those birds by the time I was grown because I heard it all my life. I didn't know if there was something wrong with these birds, what happened to these birds. I just didn't know about it. But then I finally figured it out when I got smart enough to listen and understand that the values of those that I hung out with would be my values. The actions of those I hung out with would be my actions. And this value, in order to be the friend of God, you have to value what He values. Cultivate this relationship. The friend that you love the most is the friend that you act like the most. And, and I got to thinking about this as I was studying. I, and all these sayings are not biblical, but they lead to a, a biblical principle. I think about, do I have a passion? God is my friend. Like, I, I could say me and, me and Crispin are friends. We have a lot of passions. Me and Mr. Eddie, we're friends. Me and Blake are friends. We have a lot of the same passions and, and desires and, and the same loves. We, we care about the same things. But I thought about that in the light of God. Do I love what He loves? Do I hate what He hates? Do I have a passion for what He has a passion for? Uh, you know, do I have the same values as God? When, when we become friends, then we do have those same values. I'm not, you know, I'm always friendly. Amen? I hope you're friendly. Some of you are more friendly than others. But honestly, however I feel, I try to be friendly. I, I just try, even if I have to fake it for a little bit, I just feel like it's better for me to smile if it makes you smile than for me to frown and, and you keep frowning. So, I think about this friendship. But my best friends have my same core values. Some people say, well, why are you closer to some people than others? Because they are the ones that have the closest values to my heart, too. And when you have those same core values, you're brought together. See, I don't, I'm not best friends with a bunch of people who frequent the bars because that's not my deal. I just, I just, I'm not going to go. And I don't think you should go. And I just don't think that's part of what a Christian should do. And I think we've got to set a good example. So that's not my friends, Okay. My friends are the ones that come to church. My friends are the ones that read the Word of God. My friends are the ones that listen to Christian music. My friends are the ones that do everything they can do to get closer to God. And everything that gets them away from God, they push to the side. Because we have the same core values. We have a biblical worldview. That's the kind of friends I have. Now you think about when God says you are His friend. That means in order to be the truest friend you can be to Him, you need to have the same core values that He has. It's a biblical worldview. 
You take what God says, you do it. You take what He says not to do, you don't do it. You live out the Word of God today. You're holy as He is holy. You are righteous as He has made you righteous. You are the person God has told you to be. And the truth is, today, if I've ever told you the truth, you are as close to God as you want to be. Somebody says, I'm trying. Try harder. I'm doing the best I can. Do more. You're as, cl you're as, a, you're as close. Listen, God is not up here playing some game with you. Hiding. He's not hiding, hoping you can find Him. He's saying, if you seek me and you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. He said, draw unto me and I'll draw nigh unto you. He's sitting here with arms wide open saying, if you'll give me your all, I will give you my all. He is the one wanting you to come. He's wanting you to be His friend. He's wanting you to be His lover. He is the one that made you. He designed you. That's the purpose of God in your life. God's not hiding from you. Actually, you're probably not going after God with all that you have. With all that you are. With all of your strength. With all of your mind. With all of your soul. Your heart. Everything you got. Everywhere you go. This friendship has to be cultivated. God told the captives of Babylon. When you get serious about finding me. And want it more than anything. He said I promise. You will not be disappointed. Now I ask you these questions. Number one. As the. Worship song says, I am a friend of God. Are you a friend of God? Are you a child of the Most High? Number two, what are you doing to cultivate that relationship? Let's pray.